What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatness, and it is my mission to help you to make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Enrico Rubio. He's the founder of Hacking HR and co-founder of Cotopaxi Recruitment. We're having a long and extensive conversation about the future of work and the future of HR and tackle along the lines whether HR can be the facilitator into the future of work. So stay tuned. Oh, and by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes because you're walking, commuting or in the gym, why don't you visit my webpage, workshops.work, check episode 44 and download my notes. Enjoy the show. Hello, Enrique. Thank you for joining me on the show today. Absolutely, Miriam. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a great opportunity to talk about the cool things around workshops and whatnot. Yes, and uh, you're very present on social media with your Hacking HR initiative, which is mind-blowing. <laughs> um, what you're putting out there. Thank you. And, yeah. And maybe this can be a nice way to start. Would you like to share the story behind Hacking HR and what drove you or triggered you to start creating the largest community of collaborating HR professionals? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we are on the way to be hopefully the largest community of HR collaboration. We're not there yet. But that's the dream. The dream is to create the largest community of collaboration among practitioners, leaders, technologists, vendors, consultants, all people that are interested in things that are at the intersection of future of work, technology, organizations, and people. And this community started a couple of years ago out of a, a couple of things. One is I, I wanted to do something meaningful to advance HR, to help mm -hmm. uh, HR advance. And then the second thing is that I wanted to make sure that we were closing the gap between where HR is today and the place where it needs to be in order to deliver the right amount of value uh, to, to the organizations and people to be successful in the new reality of work. So, you know, I, I was working at a company at the time and I had I had all this creativity and I had all this ideas about things that I wanted to do. And unfortunately, I couldn't make them happen in there because, mm. you know, very, very often organizations are designed to sort of crush innovation and crush creativity. Yeah. They tell you, oh, you got to be creative. You, you have to be innovative. But at the end of the day, when you do that, they are like, well, not that much, you know, like a little less creative, a little less innovative. And I had all this energy that I wanted to put out. And uh, that's that's why I created Hacking HR. It was, it was both how to help advance HR And also, how do I, you know, channel all this energy into something that is valuable and meaningful to me and to others as well? And that's, that's how Hacking HR came to exist. And today we have chapters all over the world. And I have this vision of creating the largest community of HR collaboration in the world in the next couple of years. So that's, that's, that's that. Awesome. Beautiful. So how many community members do you have already? We don't have memberships uh, as, as in, yeah. in memberships. I mean, we're going to be rolling out a functionality next year to start adding members to our community. Right now, we measure our impact by the chapters that we have. We have mm -hmm. almost 80 chapters in 30 plus countries. And the goal is that by 2020, by the end of next year, we have a total of 150 chapters, between 150 and 200 chapters all over the world. And we're going to be rolling out the membership functionality. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that I'm, we're going to start getting members as, you know, official members from Hacking HR. It would be free, but I'm hoping that, you know, we have, you know, uh, thousands of members by the end of next year. Awesome. That's a beautiful vision. Thank so you. now I'm curious because you said that you're working on helping to get HR where it needs to be, given the future of work. Yeah. So in your imagination, what is the future of HR? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny because I think about the future of HR as a non-HR future of HR. <laughs> um, it's it's funny to you know to say that way because for for many years HR has been pretty focused on the things that are sort of traditional to HR, right? Meaning mm -hmm. 
hiring, firing, paying, and ensuring compliance. Mm -hmm. And those things are not enough anymore. Those things are necessary. They mm -hmm. are necessary in the work of HR, but they are not enough anymore. When I think about the future of HR, I think HR about putting people first, meaning using design thinking mm -hmm. to create policies and systems and processes that make sense. I think about an HR that is innovative and agile, that helps the organization redesign their processes so that they are truly agile and flexible and, and innovative. I think about the future of HR as as you know, HR being a digital transformation partner for the business. Because one of the things that I'm very, very concerned about is that if we let just technologies to lead the process of digital transformation, I think we're going to be making a mistake because very often technologists only think about technology mm -hmm. and technology for the sake of technology and not technology for the sake of serving people. And I yeah. say this because I am a technologist. I am an electronic <laughs> engineer. That's how I started my career. So that's, I know how this operates. <laughs> so, so I think HR as, you know, being, putting people first, being agile, becoming a digital transformation partner for the organization and finding ways to add value in sort of ways that are unexpected, right? Because yeah. once again, you know, HR has been very transactional, very traditional, and we need a non-traditional, a non-transactional kind of HR. And mm -hmm. that's where I see the future of HR going. Yeah. You know, and like, you know, the world of traditional HR is so mm -hmm. small and the world in real life is so large that we need to sort of close the gap between the small world of traditional HR and the real life world, if that makes sense. Totally. I hear two things. One is that the traditional HR, which is hiring, firing, and payroll, much of that can actually be automated already yes. now. So yeah. then HR, if this is taken away from in-house HR, then they would have to focus on what I would call facilitation and coaching almost from what you are saying. Uh, yeah. Among other things, one of the roles of HR is becoming... You know, not just a facilitator, but as an active member of of an active protagonist of all the things that are happening in the in the world of work, right? Mm. Because if you think about facilitator, the role of a facilitator is bringing people together and making sure that things run smoothly, but from a neutral perspective, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the world of the future of work and in the world of HR, we can't be neutral in the face of all the challenges and all the transformations that we're going through. So HR has to be a facilitator, but it also has to be a, it also has to, to play a very active role and a mm. non-neutral role. Mm. So it's it's way more than just a facilitator. It's a very active member of these sort of transformations in the workplace. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting view. Would you call yourself a facilitator? I am. I am a facilitator of change. I am a facilitator of transformation. And yes, I see. So I see myself definitely as a facilitator. So when, when was the moment that you started realizing that you are more drawn into the world of HR than of electrical engineering? So when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? You know, the realization of this came probably, you know, 12, 13 years ago, I was working in technology by then, but I started working in sales. So mm -hmm. I started my career working in very hard technology. Then I switched, you know, within the technology world to sales. And I found out that I loved working with people, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, working with people, like selling stuff, but especially working with people was really fascinating. But I thought to myself, I don't want to be a salesperson. You know, I don't want to be just a salesman, mm -hmm. um, which I think is an important role. It's just that I didn't want to do that. I wanted something different. So I said, what is it that I can do that has to do with people, but it's not sales? Mm. And I found HR and I fell in love with HR. And, you know, I, I started working on it and, and here I am. You know, so I, I, I bring all this experience from coming from the technology world you know, having worked in sales and now working in, in HR. So it's all, to me, it all makes sense. And all the connecting thread in all these things is people. It's how mm -hmm. people, you know, play a role in all these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To me, it's always been about serving people. So I serve I was people about to from say a that. technology mm -hmm. perspective. I serve people in my work as a salesperson. And I serve people now in my work. I serve them in my work of a nature practitioner. And now I'm serving them in a different way from my role as the founder of Hacking HR. I have two questions. And one sure. is um, just out of curiosity. Why did you 
call it hacking HR instead of disrupting HR? Well, there's a community called Disrupt HR, uh-huh. and um, you know, I want I wanted to be mindful and respectful of this community. They have done an amazing job. They work a little different than we do. Nonetheless, I really celebrate and value the the sort of all the value. <laughs> I value mm-hmm. the value that they are bringing to the community <laughs> and all the work that they've done. So I wanted to be mindful about that, and I didn't want to you know hijack their name and, mm-hmm. and and you know steal it. So so and and in addition to that, you know, I think. Very often what happens is that when you think about software and technology, you think about mm-hmm. lines of code, right? I mean, you mm-hmm. know, like we are now connected on a on a on an online platform. You know, you and I are having a conversation on, on an online platform. This is a software. And this software is designed via lines of codes, mm-hmm. right? In programming. So if if you want to change something of in this platform, you have to go to the lines to the code and you gotta change them for the back end for what we see to be changed. So the way I see it is, and the reason why the name Hacking HR is that to change things in the surface, to change the things that are in the front end, to change the things that people see from HR, you have to go to the code, you have to go Mm. to the source, you know, of everything and make the changes in there. Mm. So the word hacking means we got to go to the source of where things are and we got to change that first to be able to see the changes in the surface because what's happened with HR for a long period of time is that we have been patching up solutions that do not address the real kind of underlying problems that HR has had over the many years that it's been around. So Mm -hmm. to me, hacking means let's go to to the source, let's go to the underlying principles and let's change those things to have a reflection on the surface and yeah. not the other way around. And what I what I hear in your words and what I like is that hacking uses, enhances what's already there, whereas disrupting means we need something else to replace it. So it actually respects and values that the work and the potential that HR already has. I think there's a combination of different things. I think there are processes in HR that need to be disrupted. Mm-hmm. And one of them is performance management. You know, I hate traditional performance management. Yeah. I think everybody does. You know, there are many people who have offered so many different solutions, but we continue to talk about performance management in the traditional way, meaning yearly basis, you know, rating based, annual performance reviews and they suck. They really suck. They are bad and they are, they are awful. They don't deliver value. So we need to disrupt that process. So that process need to, you know, we need to get rid of it and do something new, but that doesn't mean that we have to forget Mm. our history because if we forget our history, we may do something new now, but in two years from now, we may be doing something that was the same thing that we did 50 years ago. If we forget what we did before. So I think that some processes need to be disrupted. Some processes need to be hacked. Some processes need to be transformed, but never forgetting our history. Because if we forget mm-hmm. our history and all the things that we have been going through in HR, then we are doomed to make the same mistakes. Yeah. And this is true, by the way, in HR. It's true in economics. It's true in it's politics. True. You know, I mean, you look at the world right in now. In relationships. In relationships. <laughs> like, you know, you look at the world right now, you see, you know, politicians and econo- business leaders talking about things that we all know that they don't work because we yeah. have already been through them before and they continue talking about them. Right? So Past it's the dependency. Thing. Oh my dependency. goodness, it's, it's so stupid, yeah. right? It's so stupid to make the same mistakes again. I guess and it's human. Yeah, yeah. And and that's that's exactly why, you know, if we don't keep our history alive, mm. meaning like, hey guys, you know, we're trying to redefine performance management, but what we're doing is the same thing that we did 40 years ago and mm. it didn't work. Why are we going to do the same thing yeah. again, right? Why are we going to make the same mistake again? So, so to me, it is a combination of disrupting, hacking, transforming, mm. but all keeping in mind the things that we have already done and the respect also for the elders that have done yeah. so much work to transform things. So what is the space that you need in which you can have these kind of conversations? Because this leads us directly to the topic of facilitation, right? So if you want to have a conversation, how can we enhance HR? How can we hack it and make it ready for the future of work? I think. How I do think, you do that? Yeah, no, I think there are many spaces for that to happen. And we got to think about two different levels of, of those spaces, right? The physical 
connections, you know, the in-person connections and the online connections. So, for example, one of the things that we do through Hacking HR is to provide spaces to discuss about these things, both in-person through physical connections, physical in-person events, and through online events where people come together and talk about these things. So I do understand that it, it's, 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 it's amazing that sometimes we don't have enough spaces to talk about this, but that's what we're doing in Hacking HR. We mm-hmm. are trying to make sure that we can build all the spaces that we need for people to be able to discuss about these things. And so we create those spaces by creating local chapters in different cities and by providing online communities for people to come together and discuss about all these important matters. So this is the key here. Even if the spaces do not exist, there's nothing preventing people from taking action and creating those spaces. There's nothing, like you reach out to me via LinkedIn. Like there's nothing that prevents people from going to LinkedIn and sending you a message and saying like, hey, Miriam, you know, I want to talk about this. Like, why not? Right. And I Uh, totally hear you. And still, I want to challenge that, (laughs) if I may. Absolutely. Please. Because... When we talk about changing the way how HR works, this means also going inside the organization, making the leadership of the organization understand that HR has to work. So how do you avoid that the chapter and the movement that you're creating is just remaining an echo chamber where HR people are reinventing themselves amongst themselves, but it will never spill over to the organizations and never manifest? I have not found the answer to that question yet, if I can be honest. And, okay. um, it's, my, it's one of my headaches, and it's mm. one of the things that keep me, keeps me awake at night. There are, there are a couple of things that sort of, I'm, I'm, there are many things that I'm worried about when it comes to the future. When it comes to my work in Hacking HR, one of the things that I worry is, first of all, how can we make sure that the conversations that we're having are not just inspirational, but mm-hmm. are action-based, mm-hmm. meaning that you get enough ideas, insights, stories, experiences, information to act on those things. Because it's not enough to say like, the future of work will be beautiful and it will be inspiring and blah, blah, blah. And then people are like, oh yeah, that's so beautiful. But then they don't do anything about it, right? So I want to make sure, and this keeps me awake because we haven't really figured that out totally yet. We're working Mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. But that, that still remains a, a work in progress. So how do we go from the inspirational level to the actual, let's act on this level? So one thing. Then in terms of how we bring these things that we talk about, whether they are inspirational or action-based, back to the workplace, that is something that definitely remains as a big question mark. Because, you know, neither us, and I don't think anybody doing any events, and I don't want to generalize, but I'm generalizing, I don't think... <laughs> I don't think most people have found the answer to this thing because very often, you know, you have either leaders or practitioners coming to events and getting really inspired by mm. whatever they are, those events are talking about. But then when they go back to their workplaces, they don't talk about it. Mm-hmm. They don't sell those ideas. Or even if they do talk about it and so- sell those ideas, they get a no for an answer. Like, oh, no, let's mm. not do that because like, like me, or you're being too creative or you're being too mm. you know, uh, innovative. So, so it's, it's something that I think we are waking up to by making sure that we can create a strong case for the things that we're learning to implement about work and creating that strong case means showing you know in the in the business jargon showing the potential benefits of that thing that we want to do you know like how much more engagement how much more productivity how much more efficiency how much more money how much more impact we can create Mm -hmm. by doing those things and that's one key that HR has not understood yet, that it's not enough. I mean, there are corporate leaders that you come to them and you say, you know, doing this is the right thing for our people. And they are sold into it because when you tell them this is the right thing for our people, they know that it's the right thing for their people. Mm -hmm. But some other leaders still think like, okay, it's the right thing for our people, but how much is this going to cost and how much impact in revenue or profit or impact is this going to be creating? So we need to be ready to make that case in our organization. So anyway, your question is really important, but it's it's complicated. It's not an easy Yes, I see that. Apologies. I was just curious. Oh, no, it's a fantastic question. You don't have to apologize. I love the question. (laughs) And um, when you say that HR has to basically learn to better sell their ideas and their changes to the leadership in order to make a business case out of it, because obviously the CEO of a large company is not 
staying awake at night because of the people, but because of the numbers <laughs> in most of the cases. So from what I'm hearing is that HR is actually using the wrong language to really convince the leadership about the value and potential they can bring to the company. I don't think they are using the wrong language. I just think that they need to expand, you know, their portfolio of language, so to speak. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, it's like, you know, you want to like, you know, I speak Spanish and I speak English, you know, so I'm, I'm able to communicate with, you know, 80% of the world right now. So if you want to be able to communicate, you know, with 80% of the world, you're going to have to learn a new language. So the same thing applies in the HR world. You know, you go to HR and if you only speak HR, Mm -hmm. If that's your only language, yes. you are very limited in what you yeah. can do. Now you get to expand and you get to learn new languages. So your new languages are, you, you need to learn finance because some leaders are driven by the profit and the revenue conversation. So yeah. that means that you have to translate HR initiatives and projects and programs into money. You need to tell them like this, they are not just necessarily into money, but into, an, into something that makes ROI sense. So you need to understand finance. Then you also need to understand technology. So you need to start learning mm -hmm. a new language. You need to understand design thinking. So you need to understand a new language. So what's happening in HR is that I'm not saying that they have the wrong words. It's just that they have the words that are sort of, you know, kind of included in just one small box. Mm -hmm. And that box is not enough anymore. HR people need to learn new languages to be able to talk across the board within an organization. Yes. And you mentioned design thinking. And for me, one important aspect or the most important aspect of design thinking is to start with the user. Yes. So who's actually the user of our services? And I think what I've observed in organizations very often, that all these services are totally forgetting about their internal customers or clients. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then I would think that HR needs to think, okay, who is our customer? It's on the one hand, it's the employees, the staff yeah. members, but on the other hand, it's the leadership that they need to convince. Yeah. Yeah. And then maybe some facilitation skills in HR would help them to go through the design thinking process to really adjust their skills or their services to the needs of the leadership. Yeah. If, if you ask me what HR is about... The core work of HR is ensure long-term sustainability, profitability, mm -hmm. and impact of the organization that they work for. Mm -hmm. That sounds very corporate, right? I mean, that sounds like if, if HR was just for the business, and it's not. Because if you're not addressing, for example, employee engagement, employee experience, design thinking, it's impossible for that organization to be sustainable in the long term. Mm. So all of these things are pieces of ensuring from the HR perspective that the organization can be sustainable and profitable and impactful in the long term. So now what happens is that very often HR has been designing processes and systems and rules and policies and blah, 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 that are, that are meant to force people to comply with something and not create something that is fit into what people want. Let me give an image of that, one image that I never forget. Imagine a block in the city, a city block, right? And you have a sidewalk and the sidewalk was on one side of the block and then on the other side of the block. So imagine that, that image. Now imagine that to go from one corner to the other of that one block, instead of having to walk on one side and on the other side of the block, people start walking diagonally in that block. Mm -hmm. So they start creating a path diagonally in that block because, quote unquote, it's more efficient for them to go diagonally than to walk the two sides mm -hmm. of the square. So the way HR works is they have created processes and systems and rules and policies to force people to walk on the sides of the block instead of walking diagonally. So a different HR, what they would do is like, now we're looking at what people are doing and they are walking diagonally. So they are breaking the rules that we are creating. So how can we create a process or a system or rules or policies that help people walk diagonally in the best way possible instead of forcing them to walk on the sides of the of the block, if that mm. makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Totally. So the process is different. The process is not like how do we force people into what we think is the right process, but how can we design a process that really cater into the way people behave and the way people operate? So it's a very, very different mindset that we need here. And doing that, mm. if we are able to do that, we are going to resolve some of the most burning questions on how to make sure that organizations remain sustainable and profitable and impactful yeah. in the long term.
I'm a facilitator and head of customer success at Session Lab, the dynamic workshop planner tool. More than 30,000 facilitators, trainers, and coaches use our workshop planner tool and save time and effort in the design process. So, how do they do it? Our drag and drop agenda builder makes it easy to transform your ideas into high quality workshops, and the timing of your agenda automatically updates when you make changes. You can collaborate in real time with your colleagues and easily share professional looking printouts with your clients. And if you need inspiration, you can check out our library of more than 500 activities and exercises and simply drag the ones you need right into your workshop agenda. So check out Session Lab to save time and effort in your workshop design process. And now get your first two months of Session Lab Pro absolutely free at sessionlab.com forward slash workshops work. And for me, this is not only true for HR, but for all the management positions. And I came to the point, and maybe I'm just in my own filter bubble of facilitation when I say that, but I came to the point that the answer for this kind of management is actually facilitation. So instead of manage and force people to follow certain processes is to facilitate them finding this shortcut and finding the most efficient way. And for me, this is a facilitation skill. It's, it's one of them. It's one skill. And HR definitely needs to manage that skill. But once again, you know, I want to make sure that I convey the idea that in my view, HR is not, doesn't just need to be a facilitator, but it also needs to be an active participant of the conversation. Because yeah. once again, you know, being a facilitator yeah. sounds, you know, normally, you know, the role of a facilitator is a non-intrusive role where they remain neutral during a conversation, right? I mean, you are neutral in that conversation. Whereas the way I see HR is you are sort of helping the conversation mm -hmm. flow and ideas to emerge and things to work, but you have to play an active role because if somebody is saying something that it's not right, now your role is not just making sure that those things are happening, but you got to say no to that, or you got to say yes to the things that you know that are not happening mm -hmm. in the conversation, but need to be brought up to the conversation, if that makes sense. Yes, and I I wouldn't be so strict on the definition of facilitator, and maybe that's where our, <laughs> where our misunderstanding or confusion comes from, because I think a facilitator must not remain super neutral, but can also take a more active role, especially when yeah. it's in-house. But yeah. um, let's not get into the semantics <laughs> of the definitions. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly that. It's, it's an active role. It's, yeah. it's, it's an active role in the conversations that are happening in the workplace. Yeah, because for me, a facilitator is there for the group. And that's the main role, whatever it takes to help yeah. the group to get from confusion to clarity to action. Absolutely. Yes, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like to talk more about your role of facilitating this hacking HR community. Mm -hmm. And how do you make sure that collaboration amongst so many people of different cultures and different environments, online and offline, happens? So what's the magic trick that makes collaboration work? Yeah, offline is a little bit more complicated to figure out because, you know, I, I, I don't partake in all the conversations that are happening among HR people within the Hacking HR network. So it's, it's a little bit more complicated for me to say, you know, this is my role in the offline conversations. I do make introductions and I, I connect a lot of people, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a little bit more complicated to define that sort of uh, offline conversations. Now, on mm -hmm. the online, I want to say online, I don't mean necessarily virtually, you know, like, like technology-wise, but I mean... I mean online as in part of the hacking HR community. What I do is I make sure that I'm connecting people. I make sure that I'm transferring stories and ideas and experiences from one chapter to the other. I make sure that they connect and they are collaborating and learning from each other. So it's more my role here is, quote unquote, a facilitator building bridges mm -hmm. among all the participants being, you know, partaking in this community. And, you know, for, for now, that's as much as I can do because, well, yeah. you know, I, you know, we don't have that unlimited bandwidth. So the <laughs> bandwidth that I have right now is I'm connecting chapters. I'm bringing them together once every month or a couple of months for calls where they all participate and they all share ideas, stories and whatnot. 
And then I provide the opportunities for them to connect one-on-one with people or other chapters. So my role here is very active in sharing stories, connecting mm-hmm. them around, making sure that we are focused on what we need to be focused. So that's that's my role at the moment. So hopefully that role will continue to evolve into something more active as in making sure that we really are sharing stories among the chapters, but my capacity is limited right now. So, yeah. So when you describe it, this sounds very technical. So I can think of a shared Dropbox folder or a shared Excel sheet or whatsoever. But how do you create the space that the chapters actually do want to share their stories? Because it's, I think, having this community of sharing experiences and maybe also sharing struggles and challenges is a vulnerable place. So how do you create this atmosphere where people feel that they want to share and collaborate? Well, one of the ways we do it is via the the calls that we have every month or a couple of months where we bring all the chapters together. Second, the chapters share sort of an information sheet where they have access to people in all the other chapters. Mm -hmm. And then I'm always connecting chapters when they are doing an event Mm -hmm. or when they want to have ideas on on how to do something. I'm always connecting them so that they know what other chapters are doing as well. So it's very informal, so to speak. And one thing that I'm going to do next year, which is one of my priorities next year, is to make sure that we build organic, intrinsic ways for people to collaborate more and to share those ideas better. So right now it's very, as I said before, it's very informal, but I don't want to miss sort of the biggest opportunity here of making sure that they are sharing those stories, those experiences, those ideas. So hopefully by next year, we're going to be adding more channels for that to happen. It's, you know, we launched the idea of the chapters only one year ago. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So it's it's very difficult to be fully ready and fully evolved overnight, right? These things take time and we're learning a lot and, you know, we're making mistakes and we're learning a lot. We're experimenting with things. And I think as we continue to evolve, more things will be added into this community. And more channels for communication yeah. will be added in the community, yeah. So do you have a kind of hierarchy with the chapters? So is there someone who's coordinating it or is it totally democratized? It is very it is very democratized. You know, this is perhaps my nature. I don't believe in heavy hierarchies. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in silos. I believe in very flat structures where mm-hmm. everybody comes together and then discuss, you know, sort of in an open environment. Yeah. So the chapters are self-organized. And this is a great experience and also the one that applies very very neatly into the into the work of workshops and facilitating. Because yeah. if you bring people and right off the bat, when they come together, there's a hierarchy. They feel less prone to mm-hmm. collaborate and they feel less prone to be open about mm-hmm. the conversation, right? And, and you see this when you do like, you know, these events where the leadership of a company is participating. People always feel like, I want to say something, but I don't know if I want to mm-hmm. say it. Actually, in my, you know, one, one time it happened to me that we went, uh, this was probably like 15 years ago. We went to a conference. We, I was in the conference and I was with the leadership team of the organization that I was working for at the moment. And it was a very cool conference. And I stood up and I asked a question. So when I came back to the office uh, a couple of days later, the president of the company, because it was a small company, he was very upset at me because I asked that question. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? So that mm-hmm. means that it, why did we go there in the first place, right? If I mm-hmm. didn't even ask a question. So that's the way people feel very often. They feel afraid and scared of asking questions because they have this hierarchy that already exists of like right when they're coming in. So the way I design Hacking HR chapters is people come in in a self-organized manner, in a flat structure. So everybody is an equal here. So mm-hmm. to make something happen, you're going to have to convince the other person that what you are thinking and your idea is best for the mm-hmm. chapter than the other things that are being proposed. So yeah. that's the way we, we organize ourselves. Yeah. Are you using some models like the holacracy structure in order to... It, it's very much like a holacracy. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it's very similar to a holacracy, you know, with less of a structure, but it's, it's yeah. sort of a holacracy, yeah. Okay, interesting. And the reality, though, when we go to conferences or when we're in a workshop space is the hierarchy that you just explained. Do you have a tip or a hack on how to overcome hierarchy in the workshop space so that people would feel more comfortable to speak up? Just by setting some ground rules from the beginning. And mm-hmm. especially, ground, uh, 
I would say there are two things, the pre-work and the actual work. In the pre-work, mm -hmm. if there are people who are part of the hierarchy, especially higher up in the hierarchy, you got to talk to them before the actual workshop to let them know that people have to feel that they mm -hmm. can be open and transparent during the workshop. And if if they feel by, in, by any way that they cannot provide that opportunity, it's better for them not to be there because then they will mm -hmm. prevent others from being open and transparent. So it's better if you're the facilitator of a workshop and you know that people want to say things about their leadership, but they won't be able to say those things sort of in a transparent, open approach because their, their leaders are in there, it's better not to have them in there and then debrief them about what happened rather than have them in there and then preventing the conversation to flow. Yeah. Would there so, be another way to have the leaders there and still address the conversation? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a, I mean, that's the ideal case that they can mm. be there and the conversation can be open. But it, there, are, there are some times where there are instances in which there's such a, there's such a gap between what people can say and, you know, like, for example, you know, let me go back to my own story. Mm -hmm. If after this conference that I participated in, when the president of the company was very furious at me because of the question that I asked, if they had invited me to another conference where he was present, I wouldn't have said anything. I would have mm -hmm. been all quiet in there because why am I going to ask something if then I'm going to be punished for what I'm asking? Yeah. So to me, in that case, there was a, a trust sort of link that was broken. Mm -hmm. So I would not have been able to say anything if the president of the company had been there. So in that case, the best thing for me would have been either for him to say openly, you know, I made a mistake. I want you guys to be as transparent as possible. There won't be any punishment or any, you know, a consequence of you being, op op you know, open here. But if that was not going to happen, it was better for him not to be there. So I think it's, you have to take the temperature of the, of the company and the room and the pre-work and the post-work and the during work to make sure how you make this very flat conversation an open conversation to happen. Yeah. And talking about open conversations in a hierarchy-free network of almost 100 chapters, how do you then take decisions and how do you decide on what you're going to work on, what you're going to discuss on? Each chapter decides how they want to do it. Mm -hmm. They have the flexibility and the empowerment to decide what they want to talk about. Of course, we have some guidelines and the main guideline is that our, our main topic is the intersection of future of work, technology, organizations, and mm -hmm. people. So that's what we talk about. And then whatever they want to talk about that is related to that intersection, they can do. So they get the freedom to decide that. And they are empowered to decide that. Now, the key here is that because the groups are so diverse, then it's, it's difficult for anybody to sort of hijack the conversation about what they want to talk about because they have to convince others mm. that they want to talk about that. So that's a key, you know, so we're balancing out empowerment with the accountability that comes when you are in a diverse, self-organized team. So it's yeah. a very fun balance in there. And in our pre-conversation, you mentioned this big conference that you're planning and that you're co-designing the agenda We did, yeah. With all the members of Hacking HR. Yeah, we, uh, we well, not just with the members of Hacking HR, we did it with the, uh, with the open community. Mm -hmm. So, of course, That's I created what I mean. a, yeah, I created a first draft of the agenda. I put it out there and I started asking questions. You know, what makes sense? What concepts do we need to include? What concepts are not relevant to talk about? And we got so much feedback and conversations going on and people interacting among themselves. So we learned a lot and we transformed the agenda based on that co-creation. So it's all online, of course. So that limits, you know, it's not like I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people mm, because I don't have the capacity to have a conversation with, you know, 500 people at the same time. Yeah. But it was very transparent, very open, and very fluid and a lot of people participated and it was it was great it was a great conversation so how do you moderate or facilitate such a conversation with so many people where you do have different views there's not right or wrong yeah well there's not right or wrong but there are things that you know are you know like let me let me give you an example uh, if somebody wanted to talk about oh i want to talk about employment law in california mm -hmm. the answer would be That's an important topic, but it's not part of what we're talking about in the conference. Uh, we're mm -hmm. talking about things that are a little different from that. So right off the bat, you are co-creating with others, but you also have some ground rules that mm -hmm. guide the conversation and some things that you cannot do, right? Because co-creating with others doesn't mean saying yes to everything that everybody is saying. This is very mm -hmm. important because, I mean, you don't have to play the nice guy all the time as in like, oh yeah, all that you propose, we're going to do everything because then 
it doesn't happen. Nothing happens, right? So you got to have some rules, you know, that frame the, com- you got to have a framework and some rules that frame the conversation, but that do not prevent people from being proactive and from being creative during the conversation. So for example, somebody like this example that I'm using, somebody saying, let's talk about employment law in California. You can say, thank you so much for the suggestion. You know, it's a great conversation to have, but it's not part of what we are talking about in this event because, you know, most people are not participating in our event, are not necessarily from California. So this conversation would not make sense for them. Plus, it's not something that we are addressing in our events. So it's, I think it's, once again, it's a balance between making sure that you have a clear objective with what you want to do, that you have some framework in which you are operating, that you have some rules that frame the conversation, but also being open to the co-creation aspect of it. Mm. So that's the role of a facilitator, by the way. You know, the, once again, a facilitator does not have to say yes to everything. No leader has to say yes to everything. Leaders have to be open to people expressing their ideas and their creativity and their imagination. But a leader also has to make, and this is my role, I'm the leader of Hacking HR, and my role here is also making sure that, if, that we are open to everybody expressing their ideas, their opinions, but also making sure that I can communicate what, things make sense and what things don't make sense for what we're doing in Hacking HR. And that sometimes is not easy to do because you want to be a nice guy, mm. but sometimes you have to be the leader as well. So it's funny because I was, I'm, I'm a fan of this show called Friends. I don't know if you watch Friends, mm. big fan of the show. And I never forget one episode when Chandler, one of the characters in the show, he was, he became the boss in his company mm-hmm. and people loved him before that. And then they didn't love him after they didn't mm-hmm. love him after he became the boss. And one of his friends, one of Chandler's friends told him like, now you became the boss. So now your role is not to be liked by everybody. Mm-hmm. Your role is to lead them. Yeah. And that was, was such an important message because, you know, the role of a leader is not necessarily to be liked by everybody is to make sure that you're respected that yes. you build trust, that you have the confidence of your people by empowering them, by allowing them to unleash their creativity. But you also have to set some of the rules and the guidelines to be leading these teams. And I guess that's exactly how you gain the trust and also the likability of your people. Because if you're just trying to please everyone and you never take decisions, then never. people will end up not liking you because they expect some decisions and knows from the yeah. leader. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, Similar and to and parents. I think, I think people value more the the assertiveness assertiveness yeah. and the credibility of a leader who can make decisions than a leader who who tries to be liked by everybody but who can't make any decisions. Right. Mm-hmm. This is especially true in times of crisis and in times of you know conflict. Like sometimes making decisions is complicated. But that's why you are there. That's why people are following you. They don't follow you because everybody likes you. I mean, you are likable, but being Mm -hmm. likable doesn't mean to be liked by everybody, right? Some people will disagree with some of your decisions, but it's better for them to disagree because you are making a decision that for them to like you for not making anything. Mm. And I wonder to what extent it also applies to a facilitator, actually, because It's not all our role to be liked by the participants, but to give them guidance and to make the process easy, facile. Yeah. Yeah. And as you said, also to say no sometimes and maybe to point out the blind spots or also to tell a person that it's talking too much. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, you know, it's sometimes you, you do some work, you know, you and I are experienced facilitators in both in-person meetings, online meetings. And sometimes you know that there's somebody hijacking the conversation and that person doesn't let anybody else to talk. So for you, you, you got to make up your mind and say, well, you know, I have to address this situation in a proper way. And the proper way we probably won't be the best option for that one person that is talking and talking and talking, yeah. but it will be the proper way to ensure that the entire group collects the benefits and get the benefits of having that, that conversation going. Yeah. So that's the role of a leader. That's the role of a facilitator. It's not to be liked by everybody. It's to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And the right thing will be liked by everybody if it makes sense, right? Yeah. If not to be personally liked by everybody because you know, you're saying yes to everything. Yeah. When you think of you and your role as a facilitator, what is your favorite exercise that you like to do in the workshop space? My favorite exercise for what? I'm sorry? In the workshop space to enhance collaboration. 
I like to I like to do exercises where they can explore their creativity in non-focused but meaningful exercises. By non-focused means that is not something that is core of the program that we are talking about, but it sort of it's like warming them up for the conversation that will happen, right? So we do some exercises and we do some games that are targeted to unleashing their creativity before mm -hmm. their creativity is even needed for the purpose mm -hmm. of the program. Can you give um, an example? There's a great exercise that I've been doing. I, you know, I haven't done, you know, over the past two or three years, I haven't done a lot of uh, workshop facilitation because I'm doing the online yeah. facilitation of the mm -hmm. high nature community. But one of my favorite exercises is the marshmallow challenge. I don't know if you've heard of the marshmallow challenge. Mm -hmm. It became very famous, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You know, it's building this tower with spaghetti strings mm -hmm. and then putting a marshmallow on top of the of the tower. And what happens is that people, you know, it's, it's funny because people try to build the largest tower and then when they put the marshmallow on top, the entire thing falls off. Mm -hmm. So it's a great success to put people in the mood of how do we create in a fast-paced environment where, you know, we are open to ideas from everybody. And that is a no focus exercise because it, but it starts warming them up to the idea that they have to be created during the workshop. Mm, very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And another question that I always ask all my guests, and I would be curious what you say about your online gatherings that you're facilitating now is what makes an online workshop and an online meeting fail? What makes when you don't acknowledge that people are participating in that in that in those online stuff, right? That's why I don't like webinars. I don't like webinars because they are one, they go in one direction. They just mm. happen in one direction. And that's also why all of my online events that I do, they're all live. Mm -hmm. So they are online, but they are happening live. They're also recorded, of course, because some people can't watch them real time, but mm -hmm. they are live because there are many conversations happening real time that you want to make sure that you can get those ideas back to the, to the, to the people facilitating the conversation. So one of the most interesting things that make a webinar fail is when you are just talking and talking and talking and talking and mm -hmm. you don't hear what people are saying and you don't acknowledge their participation in there. That's why I love doing online stuff, but I love doing them live. So I don't mm -hmm. call, like when people, like actually my events online, when people call, the, call them webinars, I get really annoyed because I'm <laughs> like, this is not a webinar. This is a conference that is happening online. And just like, just like the good conferences, what's happening during the conference is that people can ask questions to the panel when, when the opportunity arises. Right? So how do you make sure that people feel invited and have permission to participate? We tell them. And we tell them, actually, it's funny that you asked that question because on last Monday, I was leading my last LinkedIn Live session. Mm -hmm. It was called the uh, 20 things that you must know about the future of work. And as I was reading, one of my friends who I know is a very knowledgeable person, he commented on the LinkedIn Live post. I mean, this thing was watched by 500 people at the same time. So he said, Enrique, I hate to disagree with you, but I disagree with you because of this and this and that. And I said publicly in the LinkedIn Live His name is Ira. I said, Ira, thank you so much for disagreeing. Please don't apologize because we, I welcome this agreement because that's how I learn as well. Mm. So others will be learning from you because of your, of your disagreement with me. And I'm also going to be learning. And then I address my views based on what he was saying. So I think it's difficult to provide safe space for people to participate in online events that we, re we remind them over and over again that it is okay to ask questions, that it is okay to disagree, that it is okay to be controversial. And mm -hmm. because that's, that's how we, you know, it's ridiculous that we can't be controversial, that we can't raise topics, you know, bring them up to the table because some people may not like them, right? I'm not talking about being disrespectful, by the way. Yes, you know, yes, that's one course. thing that I do not tolerate. I do not tolerate disrespect. And if somebody will come to our event to say something that is disrespectful, immediately I will call them out and say, you're not welcome here. Because mm, that, or, or yeah. your comment is not welcome here. So one thing is being controversial. One thing is to disagree. One thing is being contrarian. And another thing is being disrespectful. So you mm. welcome controversy. You welcome disagreement. You welcome contrary or opposing views. But making sure that everybody is respectful from everybody else. Yeah. And I hear that, of course, you create the safe space, what you say, by telling people that they shall participate and that they may be controversial but what i also hear is that you're walking the talk so by publicly commenting on this post 
that is controversial and thanking this person for being controversial and for challenging you. You're walking the path and you show the others that they will not be punished as you have been previously on your conference. Absolutely. And by that punishing is- those who are res- respectful right away and publicly, yeah. everyone will learn that this is not tolerated behavior. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that, that's, that's exactly it, you know, and that's the role of a good facilitator, mm. you know, acknowledging that that's happening. And mm. sometimes, once again, you know, the role of a facilitator is not to be liked, is to make sure that things are working. And sometimes you may acknowledge that point and say, you know what, maybe this is not the right place to talk about that. Uh, you know, let's say that I'm, let's say that I'm talking about future of work and somebody comes up with something about, I don't know, it's, you know, I don't like the weather, how the weather is looking in my city. <laughs> You can say, well, you know, that's a great point, but, you know, maybe we can talk about it offline because it's not really part of what the conversation that we're having mm-hmm. here, or maybe I'm missing a point. So you got to make sure that you acknowledge what people are saying without necessarily either getting hooked into that conversation because you may not want to get hooked into that conversation, but they're still acknowledging the participation of those people. Yeah, totally agree. We're coming slowly to the end, and I was wondering whether there's something that you would like to share that we haven't touched upon, because we went in a, into a totally different direction than what we actually planned. Right. No, no I, think, I think this was a great conversation. I think yes. one of the things that we talked about you know, in planning this call was about the idea of co-creating with the community. And once again, you know, if you are a facilitator and you are a designer, the best thing you can do is, first of all, set clear expectations and goals of what you're trying to do so that people can frame the conversation around that. You can set some ground rules about how things could work so that people also know that they, there may be things that they want to say or they want to see, but those things are not necessarily part of the conversation. Also, make sure that you're open to what other people are saying without necessarily either getting hooked into those things, but mm-hmm. being respectful about their and acknowledging their contributions to the conversation. And, you know, maybe feeling comfortable with saying yes and no. Mm. As a facilitator, you gotta be you gotta feel comfortable with saying yeah. no. You know, that doesn't mean that people won't like you. As long as you can really create a rationale of why the no is a no, then mm you're going to be respected. And that's your ultimate goal. Your ultimate goal is not to be friends with everybody. Your ultimate goal is to make sure that people respect your role as a facilitator or designer of these conversations. Awesome. And if someone in the audience fell asleep after a minute one just woke up (laughs) and doesn't have time to listen to the hour again, what would you like them to take away? Go back and listen to the entire thing. Uh, (laughs) Well, what, what I want them to take away is that co-creating is great, including others is great, acknowledging is fantastic. It is powerful when you are open to disagreement, when you're open to opposing views, when you're open to controversy, that's fantastic, as long as they are sort of creating a better conversation and that as a facilitator, it's okay to not be liked by everybody because your role is not to be liked by everybody, your role is to be a respected facilitator and one that can say things in a respectful way and guide and lead people to a smooth conversation. And some people may not like what you're saying, but they mm-hmm. will still respect it because they respect you as a facilitator and not necessarily because they like you as in you agreeing with all they are saying. Yeah. And so, they didn't hire you as a friend in the first place. They didn't hire you as a friend <laughs> in the first place because, you know, for that, they find somebody else and yeah. they don't have to pay their friends to do, yeah. to, agree with, to agree with them, yeah? Right? Yeah. So, so your role in there is, is different, yeah. Yeah, awesome. If now someone wants to reach out to you, uh, join the Hacking HR community, get involved, work with you, how can they find you? They can find me on LinkedIn. I am very active on LinkedIn. Enrique Rubio, founder of Hacking HR. I think I'm the one, the first, you know, when people put that name in, I'm the first one that comes up. So, you know, I'm the founder of Hacking HR. Just connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a message on LinkedIn. And my email is Enrique at HackingHR.io. So I'm, I'm findable, findable through either LinkedIn or email. Awesome. And I will put all of that in the show notes. Thank Thank you you so much for taking the time and uh, having this beautiful conversation about the future of HR and whether the future of HR is facilitation. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic, Miriam. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. 
If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day. Thank <laughs> you.